Father, thank you again for this time to be here tonight as we continue our study. We just thank you for the beautiful afternoon we had. We just pray for each and every one here. Thank you for them for being here. Father, we just want to continue to pray for the health of each and every one in the church and just all those that need your healing touch. We want to pray for those uh, people that contact me from over there in Kenya that just be with them and just grant them their prayer requests, Lord. And Father, just bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right, tonight we're going to be um, continuing on this false doctrines of Jehovah's Witnesses. This will be part six. And right now I'm just going to go over, I want to read a bunch of verses that can be used for witnessing and you know anybody that Jehovah's Witnesses might be listening that maybe they'll get something out of it or like you said you can use them yourself if you come across some but when witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses you need to get them to lose trust in the Watchtower Society as that is their only hope you know I mentioned before but the Watchtower Society is what holds them together you know if, if they lose trust in that that's the only way that you're going to pull them out of that. You know, you know, just giving them scripture isn't necessarily going to do it. you got to get them to understand that how they've been deceived by the Watchtower Society with all their false prophecies and all their other lies and, you know, about the 144,000 and different things and so forth like that. So, you know, need to get them to lose trust. Then we can show them in scripture different things that, uh, you know, contradict their, their beliefs. Now, here are some scriptures for any Jehovah's Witness who may be listening or for others to show, to use to show them that Je Jehovah and Jesus are the same when they deny that Jesus is. Now, <clears throat> you guys can turn to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Well, I'm going to read it from the King James Bible, and then after that, I'm going to read it to you guys from the New World Translation. Most of it will be the 2013 New World Translation, unless I say otherwise or whatever. So Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Now again, that's from the King James Bible. In, in the 2013 New World Translation, it says... Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Uh, I think I copied that down wrong. It should say Jehovah or whatever. But anyway, Jehovah's Witnesses say that, that only Jehovah is God and that this verse uses, this, this verse's use of God refers to Jehovah. You know, that's what they'll try to say, that that's referring to Jehovah. So I guess I did copy that right there. Whatever. But, Who is um, Jehovah? Jehovah is the true God. I mean, Jehovah is, but God the Father is Jehovah, and so is Jesus. They're both Jehovah. Jehovah is the true name for God. Everybody says this, it says that Yahweh, that's false. That, that actually is based off of, there's proof that shows that actually, that actually comes from a, a false God. What about Yeshua? Yeah, Yahweh. Yeshua is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And you know, they try to say that Yahweh is the Hebrew name for Jehovah, but that is false. Again, that's actually technically from a false god, Yahweh is. Jehovah is the true name for God. And not only that, but that's what our Bible uses. You know, we don't speak Hebrew anyway, so we should be speaking in English. It's Jehovah. You know, they are correct in the use of Jehovah. They just misuse Jehovah and don't understand that Jesus is also Jehovah. You know, it's not just God the Father. Jesus himself is Jehovah. So they'll say that this verse, um, in, uh, talking about God here, refers to Jehovah. Well, they are right in that sense, but not in what we're going to get into later on. And they're, they're wrong on some of the stuff. But Acts chapter 4, verse 12, you can go ahead and turn there. But in reference to Jesus, says that Jesus is the only name that can save us. So we're going to see that, that Jesus is the only name that can save us. But yet we just read here in Isaiah that... It says, you know, while you guys turn there, I'm going to read Isaiah 45, 22 again. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. So we just saw 
in Isaiah that there's only the one God and only he can save you. He, he saves you. But now we're going to see here in Acts 4.12. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And if you go back and look at the context, you know, we know it's talking about, about the Lord Jesus here. Well, if Jesus is the one that saves us, and we're going to look at some other verses here, but if Jesus is the one that saves us, and that we saw in Isaiah that he's God, and they're, they're admitting that, that in Isaiah that's referring to Jehovah, that Jesus himself must be Jehovah. Now, the New World Translation agrees with the King, King James Bible here in Acts. But Isaiah, go back to Isaiah, I should have had you hold your finger there, but Isaiah chapter 45 again, now look at verse 23. That, you know, Isaiah 45, 23 says that every knee will bow to God that was spoken of in verse 22, which we read, and that he had sworn himself. So reading Isaiah 45, 23 from the King James Bible says, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Now this is reading it from the same verse from the New World Translation. By myself I have sworn, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and it will not return. To me every knee will bend, every tongue will swear loyalty. So, I mean, they're, they're basically agreeing right now, you know, so far. So, now Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11 repeats this verse, but now it says it will be Jesus who we will bow before. So, you know, they're telling us in the Old Testament that, you know, we got to, we're going to bow before God, but now we're showing is in the New Testament that, that God is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. So now Philippians, um, so if we only bow before God, and this speaks of Jehovah in Isaiah 45, 23, then Jesus must be Jehovah and God. So let's read Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 through 11. And this is from the King James Bible. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And then now I'm going to read that same thing from the New World Translation. So that in the name of... Um, So that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bend of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the ground. And every tongue should openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, you know, again, there's just somewhat saying the same thing. But they're just not piecing the pieces together. That the, what is Jehovah in the Old Testament now is telling us we're bending down before Jesus. You know, we're bowing down is the correct way. Then we bow down before Jesus and... So therefore, you know, it referred to the same person, so therefore Jesus must be Jehovah. Now Isaiah 43, 11 says the Lord is the only Savior, yet Jesus said he was because he is Jehovah and our Savior. So let's go to look, look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. And this is going to be from the King James Bible, first of all. So Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So let me read that again. This is from the King James Bible. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Now I'm going to read it from the 2013 New World Translation. I, I am Jehovah, and besides me there is no Savior. So basically they're saying, you know, again, they're, they're for the most part agreeing. They're saying instead of Lord, they're changing it to Jehovah, which... You know, technically, in one sense, that is correct. You know, the Lord is Jehovah. But they're not understanding yet that Jehovah is Jesus. And that's what we're trying to point out. Now, Acts 4.12 that we just read earlier says, Only the name of Jesus will save you. And many other verses say Jesus is our Savior. You know, I look at Isaiah 45.21. says there is only one God and He is the Savior. Look, turn, turn to Isaiah chapter 45 verse 21. So, I mean, if you piece all of this together, you'll see that if, as we just read here in uh, Isaiah 43, 11, that 
it, and they're, they're calling, you know, saying the Lord, instead of the Lord, they're saying Jehovah, but they're saying there's no Savior besides Jehovah. Well, they are correct in that sense that, you know, but we saw that that Savior is none other than Jesus Christ. So therefore, Jesus must be Jehovah. So Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21, this is from the King James Bible. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Now the same verse from the 2013 World Translation. Make your report, present your case. Let them consult together in unity. Who foretold this long ago and declared it from times past? Is it not I, Jehovah? There is no other God but me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. So now the New World Translation says the Lord here is Jehovah, which shows if Jesus is the Savior, he must be Jehovah. So I mean, again, you know, they're changing Lord to Jehovah, but they're basically agreeing that the Jehovah is the Savior. So we saw in these other verses, though, that Jesus is the Savior. So if if there's only one Savior, as these verses are saying, you know, Jesus must be Jehovah. Now, Philippians 3.20 shows that Jesus is the Savior. So let's turn there. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Okay, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, the New World Translation agrees that Jesus is the Savior Jehovah's Witnesses are looking for. This is from the New World Translation. I read it to you the other day, but Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, in the New World Translation says, But our citizenship exists in the heavens, and we are eagerly waiting for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So they don't believe he's kind of new. <laughs> well, they believe Jesus started came, remember, in 1914, but he came invisibly, and only the select 144,000, basically, you know, they believe he's ruling in heaven right now, and that only the 144,000 were taken up, you know, the rest stayed here, because they're going to stay here on earth anyway, that, you know, he came invisibly, it wasn't a, a physical appearance like, you know, scripture states. Well, I think the rat, first rapture, sorry. Basically, yeah, in one sense, they, you know, they don't call it the rapture, but in, in, in our eyes, that would be basically what they were saying. Now, <clears throat> all three members of the Godhead are God, and so all are Jehovah. Now, God the Father, God the Son, or Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Ghost are all Jehovah. You know, if you look at places in Scripture, you'll see all three of them are Jehovah. Now, Isaiah 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 3, prophesizes of John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord who is God. Go ahead and turn there to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Now, the New World Translation says preparing the way for Jehovah. So, we're going to read these verses here, but you're going to see that John the Baptist was preparing the way for the Lord. So, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 in the King James Bible says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And again, now this is from the 2013 New World Translation. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, Clear up the way of Jehovah. Make a straight highway through the desert for our God. So, you know, instead of Lord, they're saying Jehovah. You know, which, I mean, again, they shouldn't be changing scripture. But, you know, it's not in one sense technically wrong. That it's just not the word God chose for us to use. He wanted us to use Lord. But, John the Baptist, they're both agreeing that John the Baptist is clearing the way for Jehovah. Or Lord, but, you know... I'll give them to Jehovah. But now let's turn to Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. We're going to see this fulfilled in the New Testament. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. Okay, Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. 
For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now again, that's from the King James Bible, but now the same verse in the 2013 World Translation. Listen to what it says. This, in fact, is the one spoken up through Isaiah the prophet in these words. A voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare ye, prepare the way of Jehovah, make his road straight. So, you know, the King James Bible is saying prepare the way for the Lord, you know, which again, which we know Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ. They're saying again, prepare the way for Jehovah. Now, Scripture in other places clearly shows John the Baptist declared the way for for Jesus. So, you know, again, if you, if you read more in Scripture, it's clear that John the Baptist was clearing the way for Jesus. And don't that mean that we should be clearing the way for Jesus too, keeping our path clear? Or well, this was re I mean, yes, that's true. We should have said, but this is referring to you know that Jesus was going to make his appearance. You know, that was when he was here physically on earth. And, you know, he hadn't started his ministry yet. So, John the Baptist was preparing everybody for Jesus' coming ministry. You know, that's really what this is referring to here in that sense. He prepared the people to get their minds right, get used to, you know, what is what Scripture says. You know, that, hey, Jesus is coming and he's coming soon. What you're doing there? Right. So, exactly. You know, in one sense, we're preparing... You know, or me or whoever, but you know, the pastors, you're preparing people for when Jesus returns for his second coming. But, you know, that's what it's referred to. So in one sense, yes, you know, all of us as individuals should prepare ourselves to be ready for his second coming. You know, you mentioned something about Jehovah earlier. The King James Bible does use the word Jehovah, you know, in, in a few different places. So, you know, it's not, like I said, that Jehovah is wrong, you know, in that, in that sense. It's just that. God chose, you know, once the Jewish person, people well, use the word Yeshua again. Well, Jewish Messianic Jews who believe, that's what, those are Jewish people who believe in Jesus as the, as the Messiah. Then those people will call Jesus Yeshua. But the regular Jews, they don't even have the curse word. You know, the, the unsaved Jews, you don't go around and say the word Jesus. That's like a curse word. So, you know, but they would refer to God as Yahweh, you know, that's, but, or, you know, they, or something like that. You know, they don't say, you know, they wouldn't say Jehovah, but, you know, again, that's also the, the Hebrew letter, uh, name for it. But again, I think that's wrong. I think that's false. I don't believe Yahweh is his name. I think it's from a pagan God and there's proof that shows that. Uh, I don't think personally Christians should be using it. I think we should be using Jehovah, just like scripture says. I don't believe Yahweh is the is the, the correct name, but uh, you know they don't usually a lot of times still they'll use some other Hebrew word that it'll mean like the name or something like that. You know, like they don't say his name a lot. But the problem is these false Bibles and the New Agers also use the term the name and they capitalize it. You know, trying to say it's for Jesus when it's it's not. It really is referring to Satan. And that's why, again, we shouldn't be using that either. We don't go around saying the name. You know, these false Bibles are changing that stuff. They'll take out the name Jesus and think they're being reverent by calling him the name. No, you call him what it says. His name is Jesus. You know, the, and the name Joshua. That's what the angel told Jesus. Mary right, name. exactly. The name of Jesus. Because Jesus means Savior. Okay, and so where did Emmanuel come from? Is that just the meaning? Of Emmanuel is his God name. You know, or, you know, his divine name. Jesus is his name as a man. man. Okay. Emmanuel is, you know, remember, Jesus is 100% God and he's 100% man. So on his divine side, he's Emmanuel. On his man side, you know, on the people as a person, then he is Jesus. And, you know, Jesus, the name Joshua and Jesus are basically almost the same name. They're not quite the same, but they're... In Hebrew. In Hebrew, yeah. And they're, they're similar. You know, that's why Joshua was a type of Jesus. And, you know, he had the name, but, you know, they're not quite the same. I mean, that's why people try to change again in these new Bible versions. They'll say that Joshua prepared the way. They'll say that in Hebrews and Acts. They'll change the name Jesus to Joshua. That's totally incorrect. 
you know, just because the name is similar, they're not the same. I mean, they're not talking about the same thing. Jesus is Jesus, and then Joshua is Joshua. And again, you know, we don't go around and saying, oh, I, I worship Joshua, the Lord, you know, Christ. You know, we worship Jesus, you know. But uh, let's see, where was I at? Um, so, like I said, you know, in other places, many other places in, in Scripture, it shows where John the Baptist cleared the way for uh, Jesus. So, in other words, you know, Jesus must be Jehovah. Now, Isaiah 41.4 and Isaiah 44.6 say that Jehovah is the first and the last. And then verses in Revelation say Jesus is first and last, showing he is none other than Jehovah and is God who has always existed and was not created. So let's turn to Isaiah 40, chapter 41, verse 4. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. We're going to look at these verses. But I mean, again, if Jesus, you know, if in these verses, if the Lord, or what they're going to say is Jehovah, is the first and the last, and then we're going to see that Jesus is the first and the last, Jesus can't be a created being, because obviously he is God. So, but let's look at uh, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 4. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. And now the same thing from the 2013 New World Translation. Who has acted and done this, summoning the generations from the beginning. I, Jehovah, am the first one, and with the last ones, I am the same. So in other words, again, I mean, they, they change this stuff. But, you know, I'm not going to, I mean, they're, they're wrong. They should be changing it. But I'm just saying, they're still getting the point that Lord Jehovah. What The point I'm trying to prove right now, then I'm not going to get into, you know, the other still should be changing scripture. But. I want to prove the point what they're trying to say. They're calling the Lord Jehovah. And then they're, they're agreeing that he was the first and the last. And now let's look at Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6. From the King James Bible. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And again, the same thing from... The 2013 New World Translation. This is what Jehovah says. The king of Israel. And his repurchaser. Jehovah of armies. I am the first. And I am the last. There is no God. But me. So now remember I said. You can see in Revelation. Go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 1 verse 11. But in Revelation. We'll see that Jesus is the first and the last. Now, both of these old, you know, the King James Bible and the New World Trans Translation were agreeing that Lord or Jehovah was the first and the last. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. Again, this is from the King James Bible. <coughs> saying, and this is Jesus speaking here, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, Write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. Now the New World Translation removes the phrase, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last in Revelation 1 verses 11. Again, because they don't believe that Jesus is Jehovah, so they remove that. Now, a turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 in the King James Bible. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And now, this is from the New World Translation. It says, When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet. And he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So see, in this one here, they're sort of agreeing because he's not necessarily saying I'm the Alpha and Omega and you know the first and the last or whatever. But he just, you know, it's a little more subtle. So they leave that one in. You know, when the Antichrist comes and he starts acting like he's God and he's spitting out scripture, he'll, he'll probably be spitting it out like that, and they'll be the ones that will be saved because it was. Oh, exactly. That, that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. I mean, that's why Jesus said people will come in my name 
And, and that's exactly what they're going to do. You know, Satan, like I said, Satan knows scripture yeah. backwards and forth. He knows the whole, all the, the Holy Bible memorized. He knows it better than all of us here combined and so forth. So he can spout it all out. And he knows, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if honestly if he wasn't even trying to spot it from the King James Bible because he knows it's the truth, but then he likes to take the truth and then distort it. You know, he might use one of the one of his Bibles. But I suppose to but, it to him to to do to deceive them with little words that are missing and stuff. Yeah. That they, right. Well, and, I mean, and you're right. That's probably a good, you know, good point that that you know that's true. That he, that's why he has his own Bibles because. And all, a lot of this stuff is missing because he wants, you know, things. But at the same time, he wants people to think that he is Jesus Christ. You know, that's the whole thing. They want him to think that he is the Messiah. He is the, you know, the, the true, you know, Christ that's coming. That, that um, you know, that's why he's called the Antichrist. Because, again, remember I told you, it means, anti means in place of. And also against, you know, and, and the Antichrist is going to do that. He's going to be against Jesus, but he's also going to be in place of Jesus. Yeah, try to. Or try, be, yeah, try to be in place of Jesus. And, and he will be temporarily. He will be. he will be temporarily, you know, for those seven years. Uh, let's see. Um, now, turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. So, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8, in the, in the King James Bible says, And under the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. And then again, the same verse from the New World Translation. And to the angel of the congregation in Smyrna, write, These are the things that he says, the first and the last, who became dead and came to life again. And then now, let's look at one more. Look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. And this will be from the King James Bible. But Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the first and the last. So again, that's Jesus speaking there. And he clearly tells you all this thing, like in one, one whole thing. You know, he's Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, and the first and the last. And again... You know, the Alpha and Omega, that's the, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I mean, kind of like him saying in English, you know, I am the A and I am the Z. You know, he's, he's the whole beginning and the end. Is the Z in the third? They have, they have less letters in their alphabet than us. They're, uh, you can't really 100% compare them. They're not, it, it's a different alphabet. But, I mean, it's similar, but it's not. You know, they don't. Directly have a Z, no. The, uh, re the same verse, Revelation chapter 22, verse 13, from the 2013 New World Translation says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So, it's again, they have a lot of this stuff in there. They're just not realizing who's speaking here and what's going on. But... Uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to point out here, that, that Jesus, you know, Jesus is the one who is making all of these I am the first and the last statements in Revelation. So if Jehovah is the first and the last, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 41 verse 4, in Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6, then Jesus must be Jehovah. You know, Revelation chapter 2 verse 8 says the first and the last died and is now alive. So now again, we just showed you that Jesus is Jehovah. So now, Revelation chapter 2 verse 8 is saying that the first and the last which we showed you was Jesus, or Jehovah, died and is now alive. Now the New World Translation says the first and the last is Jehovah. So when did Jehovah die? That's my question to Jehovah's Witness. When did Jehovah die then? I just showed you that Jehovah died. So when did Jehovah die? Now on the other hand, this is easy to see as Jesus, who is Jehovah, that did die and is now alive. Remember, he died on the cross temporarily for our sins, but then rose again from that grave victoriously on the third day. And he is now alive. And he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. But he's clearly alive. But he did temporarily die. For those three days, he was buried in the, you know, in the ground. In the tomb there. Now, this is the only time God died, so the first and the last must be Jesus, who is Jehovah. 
So again, you know, if they would just look at their own scripture, even their own scripture, you know, like that one does take out the, you know, the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, but then still in other places, they should be able to piece it together and show them that, that you know, that, that they believe only in Jehovah, but tell them, you know, show them Jehovah is none other than Jesus, Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Zechariah 12.10 says, they will look on him whom they pierced, or who they pierced. So turn to Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. I want to look at a few more verses here, you know, to help help them um, see that Jesus is the true God. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Again, this is saying who got who, you know, who was pierced. So Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Again, that was from the King James Bible. Now the same thing from the 2013 New World Translation says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of favor and supplication, and they will look to the one whom they pierced. And they will wail over him as they would wail over an only son. And they will grieve bitterly over him as they would grieve over a firstborn son. So again, they both are basically saying they're going to look on the one whom they pierced and so forth. And, uh, you know, he's, he, he's the son. Now, John chapter 19, verse 37 says this prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus when he was crucified and pierced by a spear. So turn to John chapter 19, verse 37. John chapter 19, verse 37. And we'll see this fulfilled in the New Testament with Jesus Christ. John chapter 19, verse 37. From the King James Bible. And again, another scripture said, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And the same verse from the 2013 New World Translation says, and again, a different scripture says, they will look to the one whom they pierced. Now, if you read all the verses around it and so forth, the whole verses right now are talking about Jesus being on the cross right now, being crucified. Now, again, they don't say he was on the cross. They believe he was on the torture stake. But regardless, at this point, he was being killed. You know, whether they want to say, you know, we know it's a cross, but, you know, for their sake, they say a torture stake. Doesn't matter either way, he was being, you know, crucified, he was being killed. So, I mean, it does matter, the cross does matter, but I'm just saying for their sakes right now that the point is Jesus was dying. Now, Revelation 1 7 also says Jesus is the one who was pierced. You know, we've, uh, we didn't read that one yet. Turn to Revelation chapter 1, 1 verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold. Oh, wait a second. That's okay. Jump the gun. Then. The number 8 is. Yeah, that's the one we read a while ago about being an Alpha and Omega again. But Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then again, we already read verse 8, but I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. So, we clearly see, I mean, just by the fact it's being called the Almighty and so forth, again, that's another title for God. So it's showing that Jesus is God, and we, we just saw the connection of whom was pierced. We just saw that the person who was pierced was none other than Jesus. And I'd already showed you that Alpha and Omega, which, which he's saying, that Jesus is saying, I'm the Alpha and Omega, the one that was pierced. Then he's telling you, again, we saw that the Alpha and Omega was Jehovah. So all these verses are showing that Jesus must be Jehovah. You know, these comparisons of all these many verses clearly show that Jesus is Jehovah. So precious Jehovah's Witnesses, 
who may be listening, please turn to Jesus now and ask him to save you and leave the Jehovah's Witnesses now. You know, I've clearly showed you that, that Jesus is Jehovah. You know, you say you worship Jehovah. That's great. But now I'm trying to show you that Jehovah, Jesus is Jehovah. So you need to be worshiping Jesus because Jesus is the true Jehovah. Pray for the sermon. Exactly. You know, we, we need, you know, they need to understand that. So, but like I said, when you're talking to them, we need to try to show them that they need to get up, you know, that the Watchtower Society has deceived them. And then show them some of these type of verses and stuff like that. That, you know, Jesus is none other than Jehovah himself. <laughs> now, as I've done on the other ones, again, I want to go over the signs of a cult. So, that, again, if someone doesn't, doesn't agree with me that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult, I'm going to show you that they are. Now, there are many signs of a cult that are recognized by all cult authorities. Here are some of them, and we will see how Jehovah's Witnesses fit the definition of a cult. Again, not all the signs are shown. Not every cult will fit every sign mentioned below. And I have already sh clearly shown how Jehovah's Witnesses is false Christianity, or the, no, the Watchtower Society. It's false Christianity with all their false doctrines that contradict Scripture, and now they fit the description of a cult. Number one, the leader is the ultimate authority and above the law and is infallible. This has been shown in the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses, led by the president, who makes all doctrinal decisions and have authority of discipline. They often claim they are equal, but the reality is a different story. You know, again, if we were all equal, you wouldn't be able to discipline me or whatever, you know, in theory. You know, be like Jim Jones. Right, exactly. I mean, it, if... Um, you know, that'd be, that'd be like them saying that everyone, every American is all equal. Well, we know they're not. You know, that's why we have people in the government. You know, you have the president, you have the, the Congress, Supreme Court, you have the state governments, your governors, and so forth. We're not all equal. They make decisions, and we don't like a lot of them, but they make the rules. We don't make the rules, unfortunately. You know, that, that we're not all equal. I mean, it's the same thing here in coal. There's always a leader. You know, and, I mean, that's just common sense anyway. That you, you have to have a leader. I mean, even in church, you know, anything else. You, that's why you have a pastor or something. You have to have a leader. You know, you can't just, everybody's equal or nothing's ever going to get accomplished or whatever. You know, somebody has to lead. It's the same thing in the military. If you don't have a general leading the troops and everybody's a private, you know, nothing's going to get done. Oh, I wonder about some of our generals nowadays. I don't think a whole lot gets done there either, but that's for another story. But uh, the second thing is uh, the group suppresses criticism and one is only to read approved sources. Now, the Jehovah's Witnesses have always tried to silence their opponents and critics and has often forbade Jehovah's Witnesses from reading the truth, not only in Scripture, but other books and sources. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses are very defensive to anyone who criticize them or try to silence them. I mean, there are some that are not quite as bad, but as a rule, you start really, like I'm talking now, trust me, they're going to get very defensive just like anybody in a cult. They don't like that. They'll have an answer. <laughs> oh, yeah. They have pre-answers that they've already been told. Like I said, all this stuff I'm telling you, they've already been told by their leaders, hey, they're going to tell you this, tell them this, quote this, do whatever. Now, Baptists and true Christians do not do this. Again, you show me something in scripture that I'm wrong, I'll look into it. But to you know, we don't just you know go around getting mad. First of all, you know, people don't go around accusing the Baptists of being a cult. Most people agree, unless you're a Jehovah's Witness yourself, they agree that Jehovah's Witnesses are a cult. Now, number three, cults try to never let a member leave. Jehovah's Witnesses have a long history of doing this to their people. Those that do are normally shunned by their families and friends and other Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, they're usually denied all kinds of stuff. No one will talk to them. And all they have, I mean, especially if you grew up in it, that's all you know. So you try to leave, you good, you know, you're not going to make it out there too easy because, you know, unless you have, you get saved as a true Christian and then you have believers, fellow believers helping you out. But if you just leave the cult and then go back into another cult, say like Roman Catholicism or something like that, you're not going to ever survive out there. And they stalk you. And exactly. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't, don't torment. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it, it'll make your life miserable. And again, they'll also keep trying to tell you that, well, you're going to go to hell because you left the cult and so forth and all the time. You know, if somebody leaves the Baptist church, 
you know, if they're truly saved, they're not going to hell. Now, if they're not not saved, I don't care what church you live in, they're going to hell. But, you know, if they're truly saved, it doesn't matter because you left the Baptist church all of a sudden, well, now you're going to hell. No, that's not how it works. But cult claim to be the one true church and salvation is only by them. Jehovah's Witnesses say this and like other cults claim they go back to the apostles. Now salvation is by Jesus Christ, not a church. You know, remember the Roman Catholics claim they go back to the apostles. Well, so the Jehovah's Witnesses and they say they're the true church. So, you know, obviously they can't both be the true church. In fact, neither one of them are. But again, that's something else. But now... Now, the next fifth thing is only the leaders of the cult can understand their literature. This is what Jehovah's Witnesses leaders say. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses are told they can only understand Scripture by studying Watchtower literature along with it. You know, all, I, mean, I told you before, they'll get the literature and they'll have read this and then they'll have a pre verse in there. Now, read, I'll read this and you read this back to me, kind of like Roman Catholics do with the priests and all that. That they'll say something and they already have memorized. I'm supposed to say this bad. No, no, that's not what, what you're supposed to do. So, I mean, even if they're using scripture, they don't really study, not really study because they've already got it predetermined what, what it's going to mean by what the leaders tell them. This is what this verse already means. They don't get to look at it and say with their own, well, I read that. That's not, I, I'm saying that, that Jesus is Jehovah. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, they don't, they don't get that freedom. Now, another thing is cults add scripture, scripture and often have their own books. I have shown how Jehovah's Witnesses add the Watchtower and Awake magazines. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses also have their own Bible, the New World Translation, you know, just like Roman Catholicism has her own translations. Now, cults also subtract from Scripture. Jehovah's Witnesses remove many verses and words from their Bible. Now, cults use intimidation and fear for obedience. Jehovah's Witnesses have done this over the years, threatening expulsion and other punishment. They even have their own laws for their community of do's and don'ts. Now, cults are often involved in illegal activities. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses have many cases of child molestation that have never been reported. Now, cults always distort the gospel and add works for salvation. And I've already shown this is to be true of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, another thing that cults will use means to deceive and control their followers. And I already mentioned how the leaders will use scare tactics that Armageddon is coming soon and that only as a Jehovah's Witness can they be ready. They have also manipulated their Bible and twisted much scripture as well as their literature to deceive the people into believing Jesus is not God. You know, I already mentioned like John 1 1 and other things. I mentioned, you know, showed you some stuff how they adapt to their beliefs, you know, about the public preaching and so forth, or changing things to Jehovah instead of Lord, or things such like that. They have they have lied to them about prophecies and about hell. You know, they deceive their, their people. They've like, lied about these things, about, about hell and about different prophecies. And I've already shown you they were they were wrong in some instance. And that's why, you know, like I said, you can't trust the Watchtower Society on prophecy. How do you, why are you going to trust them on your salvation? They don't believe in the Holy Spirit either. No, they don't believe in the Holy They believe the Holy Ghost is is a, a force, you know, that, like a wind or whatever. You know, that he's not, they don't believe he, that the Holy Ghost is God. Or he gives us our feelings and no. our conviction. And our no. Say it, say it. Now, cults are often legalistic on how their members must live. Jehovah's Witnesses are the same. I've already mentioned some. Things such as not celebrating birthdays and holidays and not allowed blood transfusions. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses are to only associate with other Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, as a rule, I'm not saying they won't you bump into somebody on the, on, in the gas station or something. They won't talk to you. I've talked to Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. But, I mean, as a rule, they're certainly not going to be hanging out with you or going out of their way to, you know, have a big conversation with you. Now, cults use Christian terms with different meanings than used in Scripture or in standard Christianity. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses use many terms with different meanings, such as being born again, where only the 144,000 are the ones that are supposed to be born again, and the meaning of the Millennial Kingdom. Again, they have different meanings for the Millennial Kingdom. You know, they believe that, that you know, the thousand years is already going on. Jesus is already up there reigning right now, starting in 1914. And again, you know, so... They, they show that the born again. That's why I say you got to be careful when you talk they don't to people. Think they live no, because they believe that only the hundred forty-four thousand go to heaven. The other people are all, all going to stay here on earth. 
they, they, they're never going to go to heaven, you know, so they weren't left behind because they were never supposed to go into heaven in their sense, you know, in their belief. They, they were never quite good enough, so they were, you know, they weren't that 144,000 to quite make it in, you know, but, they, but they, they're they going to stay right here on earth and they're fine with that. I mean, I've talked to Thomas Witnesses and they're like, they're fine with staying right here on earth. So, you know, they, they don't see it as, you know, and, 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 and they actually teach that you don't have to be born again because you're staying here on earth. The point of being born again was only for those 144,000 because you need to be born again to go to heaven. But since they're staying on earth, they don't they don't believe that they even need to be born again. So, you know, that's why I say you got to be careful when you talk to people about being, you know, really talk to people. Don't just say, hey, are you born again? Or, hey, you Christian or whatever. Because their meaning is different. Though. Cults, yeah, they have different meanings. And Roman Catholics will tell you they're Christians and so forth. They're different, you know, Jones Witness will tell you they're Christians. So, now, normally, cults also have other literature, as I mentioned, books, and etc., that are considered equal or above Scripture. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses, as I mentioned, have the Watchtower and Awake magazines, and as I said, their own Bible and World Translation, which changes the mass for false doctrines. So, I mean, I kind of already mentioned that, but it's not quite the same as what I mentioned. But And uh, one other last definition, and like I said, there's other ones, too, that you could do, but... Jesus is replaced by someone or something else, or at least very minimized. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses deny the deity of Jesus and say he is a created being and formerly an angel. Remember, they believe that you know he was Archangel Michael. Now, their Bible minimizes Jesus by either removing his titles or making them lowercase, removing his deity. So, you know, again, little things like that, even in their Bibles, it may seem, well, that's not that much of a big deal. No, it is a big deal. When you're taking the name Lord and making it just a lowercase Lord, there's a big difference. Abraham was Lord to his wife, Sarah, but he was a lowercase Lord. Jesus is capital L Lord. He is Lord of Lords. You know, there's a there's a big difference there. Now, for those who have family members, friends, co-workers, or others that we know in the Watchtower Society, we need to let them know the truth and get them out before it is eternally too late. God loves precious Job's witnesses' souls as much as anyone else and wishes that all of them would call upon him for salvation. But they must get out of the Watchtower Society. And remember, I have my own relative that, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm not speaking just, you know, that I don't care about them. I do care about them. They're all precious to God and to me just like everybody else. Now, for any precious Jehovah's Witnesses souls that may be listening to these sermons on Jehovah's Witnesses, I pray that you get out of the Watchtower Society and turn to the real Jesus of Scripture by repenting of your sins and admitting you are a sinner and calling upon Jesus to save you. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded you. Did you have a question? No. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And then stay there, hold your finger there when you get done. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. We're going to look at just a few verses here. We'll be closing here shortly. But to remember, Satan is the God of this world who has blinded you, you know, for you Jehovah's Witnesses that maybe listen. And I'm going to show you this here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And this is from the King James Bible. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Let the real Jesus of Scripture open your eyes. The Watchtower Society will only lead you to an eternity in the lake of fire. You must have that have the Jesus of Scripture as your Savior, not the Jehovah's Witnesses Jesus, who is really Satan. Now Jesus loves all souls, including Jehovah's Witnesses, and wishes that none should perish. Today is the day of salvation. Call upon Jesus today before it is eternally too late. Let's turn, keep your finger there, but then turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. But we all know, you know, we never know when our, when our time is up. You know, we just had one of our brothers in Christ, you know, went home to be with the Lord just the other day. And, you know, I don't think he said, well, all right, I'm not going to be around a week from now or something. I mean, you know, we don't really ever know. So, for those that are unsaved, 
Today might be the day that you don't you know, take your last breath, so get saved before it's too late. But 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then turn back to 2 Corinthians again now. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. So 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So again, these verses clearly tell you don't put it off because you don't know. Jesus could, you know, we never know when he return or anything else. And you don't know when you're going to take your last breath. And let's look up, um, we got two more verses we're going to look up here. Look up Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. It'll be right after 2 Corinthians. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? That's Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And I'm asking that to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, I've got any, but ye are sons. Well, it's in Scripture. I don't remember. I got the wrong, wrong verse then, but it's, it's in there. Well, I don't remember. Oh, right here, 16, verse 16. Yes. I knew it was there. Typo, that's all. Alright, so Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. So Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So again, I'm, you know, I'm asking Jehovah's Witness because I'm telling you the truth. Have I become your enemy? You know, I, I'm trying to, to, re, to, to reach you to, you know, lead you out of destruction and lead you to the truth. I know we oftentimes don't want to hear the truth, but we need to hear the truth. Yeah. Now, precious Jehovah's Witnesses, if the Watchtower Society admits they are not infallible and their writings are not inspired, and they are not inspired, and they have been wrong many times on prophecy and they have lied to you, then how can you trust them for your eternal soul? You know, I've already mentioned that many times. And I've showed you how they themselves admit they're not inspired and their writings are not inspired. But yet scripture says it. They admit scripture says it's inspired. So if they've been wrong on that, you know, let's trust what is inspired. Why not trust the Holy Bible and the King James Bible that is inspired rather than the watchtower that admits it is not inspired? Let's look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. This is showing you that the King James Bible is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now that's from the King James Bible. Now I want to read it again from the New World Translation. This is what it says in the New World Translation. All scripture is inspired of God and beneficial for teaching, for reproving, for setting things straight, for disciplining in righteousness. So even the New World Translation says that all Scripture is inspired of God. So, you know, inspired by God, you know, they say of God, whatever. But, you know, even they are agreeing that Scripture is inspired. You know, their leaders themselves tell you that Scripture is inspired. So why not trust what Scripture says? Turn to the King James Bible like you originally had. It is infallible. Trust it. Not your New World Translation, but even in your New World Translation, I've shown you some things. Trust it and not the Watchtower Society and the leaders who admit that they're infallible. And in closing, who will you trust with your eternal soul? 
the uninspired Watchtower Society and men who have been wrong in the past and lied to you are the inspired Holy Bible and the King James Bible and God. You know, who are you going to trust? The inspired Holy Bible and God? Or are you going to trust the uninspired Watchtower Society? You know, that's your choice that you need to make, but you need to make the right choice because if you choose the wrong choice, you choose the Watchtower Society, then you're going to end up in hell. But if you choose to trust God, what He says in Scripture in the King James Bible, and you believe it and trust in Jesus as your Savior, who is none other than Jehovah, you shall be saved, and then you'll spend eternity in heaven. And I pray that it'll be the latter, that you will trust in Jesus as your Savior. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here, and this study here on Jehovah's Witnesses. And Lord, we do pray that for any Jehovah's Witnesses out there that might be listening, that they'll take to heart what I've shown them here, and, and just look it up for themselves. And Father, just understand that King James Bible is inspired. Jehovah is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they need to turn to Jesus as their Savior. And I do pray, Lord, that they'll be convicted. And, and tonight will be the night before it's too late. To not to turn it off. That they'll turn to Jesus today. And Father, we just pray that uh, also that others might be able to use these to witness to Jehovah's Witnesses when they, when they come to their house or whether they may see them out on the streets or wherever it may be. And that, you know, use some of these examples to show them that they might be able to win them for the Lord. And Father, we just pray for safety for each and every one who go home tonight. We just thank you for this opportunity again that you gave us here. Ask you to bless the week. Bring us back safely on Wednesday night. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>